When life throws you a curveball, how are you going to handle adversity? Welcome to the Fearless Mindset Podcast, where you're about to go on a journey as I interview security, business, and entertainment leaders on what it takes to stay fearless. I'm your host, Mark Ludlow, and enjoy today's episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Fearless Mindset Podcast, where we talk about MMA fighters to we talk to Navy SEALs and Delta operators, to lawyers, attorneys, to everybody you think of that's fearless in their approach in life and a fearless in, uh, in how they deal with life. And uh, we have a uh, very unique guest today. When I say unique, it's because I think Mike Grues is our first attorney we've had on the show. So congratulations, Mike. You're our first attorney. <laughs> I don't know whether I'm honored or I feel out of my class. <laughs> Me. And uh, Mike and I bounced into each other at ATAP in Orange County during the, the three-day conference. And we're at a mixer and we, we changed, exchanged cards in a little networking event. And, and I decided it would be great to have him on the show because, we, you know, we're dealing with uh, a very risky environment with uh, crime at an all-time high crime index in LA is exploding. And, you know, a lot of our clients that, you know, in the executive protection industry, which I work in, you know, part of that is threat, threat assessments, risk assessments. And uh, Mike's had a, uh, a career of doing those type of things for some high profile celebrities and stuff like that. So he'll go into that, but people that don't know Mike, uh, he is the owner of the Brewer law firm in Orange County. Got a background from the L.A. Uh, DA's office, and he did some stuff in the Army as well. He's a judge advocate and uh, also worked with uh, the Secret Service, doing some training with them in uh, threat, ma- manage- uh, threat management, I think it was. And uh, so welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks for your time. I know you're busy running your firm down there in Southern California. Yeah, thank you for having me. Just one correction. I was not a judge advocate. Um I did an internship with the army and it was not a good time to go in the military because of cutbacks, what have you. And I decided not to make it a career. And that's when I diverted off to end up where I am. Sounds like it was a good move. <laughs> I, I, that's the one regret I have in my life though. I'll Interesting. You, I really wish I had spent some, some real time in the military. Wow. Not many people, especially an attorney would never admit that admit to that. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I, I respect the military. I, I really respect what they do, especially in uh, the years since I, I was there just before the first Gulf War, Desert Storm. And, um, you know, a lot has come after and I respect those guys. In fact, I'm active in a couple of charities right now to raise money for, for wounded veterans. Oh, nice. We well, appreciate that. I really wish I had done some time, but that, that's one, my one regret. I've had wow. a great career. That's pretty profound. Thanks for sharing that. That means a lot to the audience. Our biggest audience, I think, of law enforcement, military guys, but a lot of military vets that listen to the show. So thanks for that plug for those guys and gals also. Um, you know, I was just looking at your background and your notes, and I'm like, dang, you've done some uh, wild stuff, worked with some high profile people and some stocking threat assessment cases. And uh, yeah, just what, what about being a DA in LA? What did you enjoy? What did you hate when, in your time down there? Oh, I enjoyed in the DA's office being court. Um, that's one of the things I got out of my, if you want to hear that part of the story, how yeah. I ended up there was actually the army internship. Um, I went to law school and I thought I wanted to do international law. I wanted to do something with the CIA or state department or something like that. And so I, I got this army internship and it was a chance to go to Europe. And I had been studying French and German and the history and culture, world affairs and all that. And I quickly found out, however, that at least from my opinion, international law was pretty boring. Um, I was in Heidelberg and, you know, it was contracts and this and that. And and I got the opportunity to said they needed someone out on the frontier. The frontier at the time was the border between East and West Germany. This is just before the wall came down in 1989. Um, They wanted somebody to go out at a place called Grafenbeer which is a big area that was in West Germany on the Czech border 
where we'd play war games with tanks and they needed somebody to go out there and do court martials. And uh, also at a place called Bamberg, which was the home of the first army division there in, in Western Europe. And I said, sure, it's, it's gotta be what I'm doing. So I went out there and spent some time and I found that I love being in court. And so then, I, as I said, I decided not to make the army a career. It was a bad time to be in the military. A lot of guys that thought that they were going to be lifers were getting forced out. And um, so I decided to pick an area of the country where I wanted to live and be a prosecutor. And my first place was um, San Diego. Um, and the military followed me there. I didn't expect it, but I got to San Diego County, which probably has one of the largest you know, military populations in the world. And the military cut bracks. And some other factors led to the county going broke. So they put. I did not know that. Yeah, they put a hiring freeze on in the year I got there. So we were told um, we have a hiring freeze. We can't hire you. We don't know if and when we can. And if you're on probation, it applies to you and everybody's still on probation, which was everybody in the first year. It's been nice knowing you. So within a year of getting out of school and, and getting there, I was out looking for a job again. Long story short, end up in L.A. I'm working there in the trenches, dealing with a lot of the cases. I heard about um, one of the special units that was looking for people. Being young and dumb, I thought I could take my resume over and walk in the boss's office, and I did. And um, introduced myself, gave him my resume, and and I left. And uh, there was a guy. Um there who was the number two in that division by the name of Scott Gordon, who became a lifelong mentor. He gave me a call a short time later. He said, well, there's, there's not an opening in that division or we filled it. He says, but we've got an opening on the stalking and threat assessment team. Are you interested? I had no idea what that was, but I said, sure. And so the next thing I know, I'm in this elite unit of prosecutors. Um, it was really unique with, with, Law worked with law enforcement, with probation officers, with uh, psychologists, with parole people to go in and do something that was unusual, whereas most crimes have already been committed by the time you get them. Stalking and ongoing threat cases are cases that are still going on. And your focus is not most of the time to solve the crime, it's to figure out how to make this person stop. And so it was really unique, uh, revolutionary. I got there a short time after it started and um, I got to do a lot of cool stuff. And then that shaped the career I have now. Sounds like a wild journey. I mean, yeah, I'm reading in my notes here that you sent an email and you really worked with some powerful people in Hollywood. Like I saw uh, uh, Jeff. Jones and then, uh, of course, Steven Spielberg and Madonna, those, uh, those were stocking cases. And, uh, what was that like? What was your role in the stocking case just to, uh, educate that, that client on what they should do legally by the laws of California or what that looks like? Most of the time we, with the celebrity cases, we didn't even deal with the clients. Um, we were dealing with their security people. Um, the Spielberg and Madonna cases, I had a bit role in. I came in in the back end of those. Those cases were already going on. And I assisted the other prosecutors that were working on those. Um, I'll tell you more about those cases you, if you would like. Yeah, sure. Uh, and then I was first chair on the Gwyneth Paltrow stalker case. And I handled cases involving Axl Rose, Jackson Brown, Pamela Anderson, people like that. So when you say you're on the chair, you're advising the teams on uh, what to do, uh, countermeasures. Uh, go ahead. Well, I was the lead prosecutor on those cases. And okay. And the Paltrow case actually went to trial. Okay. And then I was the lead prosecutor on uh, the other cases I mentioned, none of which did go to trial. All end up, ended up in a resolution, which many of these cases, what we're trying to do is they were unusual also in a sense, we're really not looking for punishment for these people. Most of them are mentally ill. Almost all of them are mentally ill. Interesting. So we're trying to figure out what makes them tick, what's their pressure point, what to make them stop. And we're not looking to put them in prison. In fact, most of the time we didn't want to put them in prison. We wanted hmm. the leverage of that 
to say, you need to go get your treatment and you need to stop bothering this person. And if you don't, then this is the leverage we have. So we, we never wanted to impose it, except in rare cases. I can tell you about a couple of cases we did that were very serious. But most of the time, we wanted the person to get help and stop what they were doing. So you say 90% of the cases, like you said, ment- they were mental illness of some sort, not taking their medication. Yeah. Bipolar disorder, delusion issues. Erotomania, delusion, a lot of delusional people. Um, sometimes combination of, of drugs and mental illness. We see that a lot. I still see that a lot today in the cases where I represent victims. And um, the drug problem in this country is just burning oh. control. Let's, let's hit on that. I mean, is it the stuff coming over Mexico? Is it just global? Is it just supply and demand? The fentanyl? What, what do you see out there from your, your sources? All of the above. But we've, um, not to get on a soapbox or get political, but we had the naive idea that we simply end the drug war and walk away and it was going to solve itself. And that hasn't happened. The biggest problem is addiction. Addiction. And what that does to people, and we're seeing it in in younger kids today, and we're seeing, you know, people wreck their lives, wreck their brains, causes emotional problems. I was talking to someone today about the marijuana epidemic and how strong the marijuana is today and, and how kids are using it and the marijuana-induced psychosis and the long-term damage that it can produce. We're just, and we're seeing our cities on fire, right? Last couple of years, we've seen our cities on fire, and a lot of that is is drugs. Almost all the cases, all the police shootings you see, whether justified or not, they're starting off with a person who is fueled by drugs in just about every case. Wow. So most of these shootings we're hearing about nationwide, they're all, would you say 50%, 90% are connected to some drug deal that went south? Someone didn't get paid their cut or whatever? Well, it's not just the drug deal that goes south. That's certainly part of it. Um, but you also have the people that are on drugs. Um, you know, George Floyd, for example. Yeah. Not to justify what was done there, certainly, sure. Um, sure. by a police officer. Certainly that was a tragedy. Sure. You know, right. drug, George Floyd was a drug-addled guy who was passing counterfeit money. Is that what it was? Oh, I, I wasn't aware of that. Okay. Or it's drug habit. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So without, a, without the drug problem that we have, a lot of these cases never happen. A lot of these situations never rise. Wow. So, yeah, obviously we got a, a major uh, problem. A friend of mine uh, told me a story of a certain resort that he worked on. Uh, they had a guy, almost one of their guests in the rooms almost died because he had marijuana that was laced with fentanyl. Yeah. And it almost killed them. Yeah. And that's what's happening. The marijuana stuff they're bringing over, it's not safe, safe at all. But, you know, the enemy that wants to take us out, they don't care. They're just shipping it over. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've been hearing about that lately. And in vape pens even, I hear that it's happening with, uh, you know, whatever is, is put in a vape. Wow. Wow. So that's a huge problem. And our so-called homeless problem vast majority of that's drugs. Yeah, I would, I would have to agree with you. I would say, well, what would you say 90% of that is addiction issues? I, I hate to put a percentage on it because I know somebody out there is, you know, some challenge going to disagree, but yeah, sure. I see stories, for example, about, you know, the median home price in Orange County has gone up. It's going to lead to more homelessness. You know, the median home price in Orange County going to 500 from 500 and 25,000 to 535,000 or whatever, pick a number, didn't create the homeless population. Mm. The people you see out there don't have $500 to pay for a house. Right. If they had $500, they'd use it on drugs. That's why they are where they are. Right. True. By and large. Okay. And then you get right. into questions of the mental illness, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? come to believe it doesn't really matter. Usually they're, they're there together. Mm. Either the mental illness led to the drug use or the drug use led to the mental illness or a combination of the two, but however you get to it, that's what you have. 
So would you say it's mostly stalker cases? The stalkers are actually like mentally ill, like you said, and then probably on something of some sort to motivate them. You know, they were all, I'm trying to think back. They were all over the board. Um, not all of them were mentally ill. Some of them were revenge type cases. Mm. Um, one big case that I can think of was a death penalty case because it's a, um, ex-husband killed and murdered his ex-wife. Okay. So you have situations like that as well. Um, but a lot of mental illness thrown in there. And I can't tell you about those particular offenders necessarily what their situation was. It's been a lot of years and I don't remember. And that really wasn't our focus most of the time anyway. Right. To what got them there. They were there. We were dealing with the situation. What's what's your biggest client needs now that you uh, are dealing with? What's the big hot thing that law firms like yourself are dealing with? I have a very unique practice where I represent predominantly victims of crime. You don't see that very much. So I, I can't speak for a lot of places out there, but yeah, a lot of it's drug driven. Like I'm saying, both both in the victims I represent and the perpetrators that they're dealing with or in the defendants. I, I do some selective criminal defense for people if um, their conduct doesn't offend me too badly. Uh, <laughs> you know, I stay away from the worst of the worst, but I, I deal with cases that nor I like to say normally law abiding people get into DUIs and things like that. I do some of those and there's a lot of that and the substance abuse and alcohol. Mm. Um, I'm seeing more and more young people. And I was actually talking to a doctor this morning about like, we were talking about the marijuana, sure. marijuana induced psychosis. So the long-term damage that they do to themselves, especially among young people, high school and college age people, we're seeing more and more of that. Um, and the other stuff we, we see, you know, random crimes come and go. I deal with a lot of victims or have been dealing with a lot of victims this year of extortion. Oh, really? Interesting. Which are cases that have generally, I don't think any relation to drugs that I've seen, but it's, it's uh, sort of the crime du jour. Okay. The number of people, number of victims I've represented are wealthy people, you know, doctors and other professionals, and they're driving an expensive car. Younger, attractive woman approaches them. He uses a lack of judgment and, and gets involved to some degree in some sort of a liaison, whether either a one-time sexual liaison or an ongoing thing that goes on for a while. And um, at some point, he starts getting blackmailed. I've been I've been seeing a number of those this year. That seems to be the the thing around town lately. Where do these uh, predators hang out to find your clients? Are they hanging out at high-end restaurants or high-end? Uh like Nordstrom, Saks Fifth Avenue, down at Fashion Island. Where, where are they targeting? All over the place. All over the place. And, and I don't always know all the details because I don't really need to know. Um, I just need to, to make the conduct stop. But I think it might be some social media. Some of it may be targeted. They may be targeting individual people uh, for reason, or it may be random. You know, maybe seeing a professional looking guy driving a, a really expensive vehicle, something like that. Um, one case I had, it was a, a client of the gentleman. The gentleman owned an insurance company and it was a client he had that proposition, propositioned him and they had an affair for a while until she started demanding money. <laughs> to keep quiet for the family and all that. <laughs> exactly. Hush money. Yes, exactly. What age group? Is it just across the board? Not really any age group. It's just... Uh, they just yeah, focus on some of these. Well, really interesting. Yeah, ger- ger- I'm trying to think. Um, generally, the males I have, the male victims I have on those are generally a little older, older probably at least 50. Okay. Is it wow. people attain a certain status in life, you know, and income, what have you? The allure. So the the predator, the person looking for that, might be hanging out at. Javier's in Newport Beach or, you know, at the bar, you know, hanging out. So that's a good example. <laughs> just hanging out, having drinks with their girlfriends or whatever. And they see the guy rolling. Ah, there we go. Nice Rolex watch, nice suit. 
Yeah. Watch where he walks in. Oh, nice car. And then let's see when he comes back again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or it could be a, somebody targeting a woman, a high net worth woman. I oh. haven't seen that, but it could be. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. So it's usually the male being targeted. I, I tend to see a lot of these cases in certain immigrant communities. Oh, okay. Oddly enough. That's bizarre. It seems to be their their crime du jour. But I, I saw that when I was a prosecutor. I think it's I think it's kind of the same thing that you see certain immigrant communities develop because somebody moves there or a group of people move there and then they tell their friends and then they come in. I think it's the same thing with this crime thing. Somebody gets an idea and then they pass it along to their friends or their colleagues. And so it develops in certain communities to be, you know, the the crime of the time. You know, it's interesting we're talking about kind of uh, the, the stocking thing and the predatory things. I've been hearing there's a huge issue with the Chilean gang criminal network in Orange County and San Diego County. There's some context that I have down there. Yeah, I I haven't heard that, but that doesn't surprise me. Um, one of the things I was referencing when I was talking about uh, this phenomenon before is when I was a prosecutor. For a while, I prosecuted something called the South American Theft Gang. And there was a group of South American criminals, for whatever reason, they developed this, this scheme and they were robbing jewelers. They were following them home, following them, you know, if they would have their money or whatever, or jewels. And they would do like a, a moving takeover robbery of them in their vehicle and, and take their possessions. I also prosecuted some cases that were Filipino theft gangs where it would steal checks out of mailboxes. So certain people in the, in the Filipino community had gotten this idea and, and passed along. And this was, this was the thing in that community for a while. So it's very specialized target. Yeah. Again, target like I, said, I think it's just the idea. Yeah. People in certain communities, you know, a couple of guys in a certain community get the idea and the people in their own community are the, are the people they pass along to and pass along the idea or get to work with them. <laughs> Well, from a threat management perspective, what is your advice to um, the ultra high net worth? Uh, I mean, family offices that are out there to what the, the best advice you can give those folks that need to protect themselves, especially going into the holiday season or coming up on Thanksgiving, Christmas, you're going shopping, you know, just uh, becoming a target. What's your advice from your professional opinion? Oh, a whole lot of things, but. I think for starters is to leave the expensive car at home. <laughs> Might be a good idea. Maybe to, to do more of your shop. I'm just thinking off the top of my head. Sure. Maybe do more of your shopping during the day. Um, make sure that you're in a high volume area. Um, I mean, we've even seen some takeover robberies here in Orange County at places like South Coast Plaza, though. I heard about that like a month ago, right? I think it was a little bit longer than that, but there was a robbery, I think, at Avenue 52. The, yep. The restaurant uh, right there along one of the entrances, and they just yep. patrons and robbed them. Um, we're seeing more and more of these types of things in Orange County. Gangs are coming down from L.A. County. Uh. I was in court a couple of months ago, and, and a, a case was called, and there were about eight defendants. Um. It was just interesting. And I knew one of the defense attorneys and I just leaned over like I sometimes did say, hey, what's what's that about? And it was a gang from L.A. who had come down to Newport Beach and were trying to rob houses on the port streets. Luckily, the police had gotten wind of it ahead of time. And I think some of the police in L.A. actually followed them down and uh, they nabbed them. Nice. But we've, we've seen that more than once. I've, I've heard about that in a neighborhood near me. No kidding. Wow. Things from LA came down. Yeah. We're breaking into houses, breaking through glass doors and things like that and stealing things and then trying to hit the freeway and, and make off with it and get away. Are they becoming more bold than lately? Is that kind yeah. of the lack of prosecution? They know they're not going to get stuck with anything. They're going for it. I, I can't tell you what's going on in their mind, but that seems to be what the case is. It seems that criminals are, are more emboldened these days and branching out, branching out from their home areas. They usually stick. They used to stick up in Beverly Hills and West Hollywood. That yeah. was the, their turf they ran. Another Orange County was the most, 
the, almost the Iron Curtain bubble. Nobody would ever touch Orange County, Newport Beach Coast. Yeah. And you've been seeing on the news, like I have, the jewelry store heist, the smash and grabs and, and things like that. So it's not just in Orange County. It's not just in L.A. It's all over the country. Do you think it's going to stop or is it up to the DAs of those cities that do the prosecution? I don't think it's going to stop in the near term. I think it's going to take a lot of effort to break that momentum. And it's, yeah, I think you're right. It's a move, kind of like a movement that just got created over the last year. Is really bad in San Francisco and almost migrated down to LA too. Yeah, it, well, it's all over the country. I think you say the same thing about Philadelphia, Chicago, what have you. Criminals are pretty been pretty emboldened over the last couple of years. Wow. And yeah, we just did. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's, it's going to get worse before it gets better. It's going to take yeah, some big push back and and some major pushes by politicians and by law enforcement. They're just not prosecuting for whatever reason politically, I guess. I don't, I don't get it. The, the bail laws and things like that. Making it too soft for the, the criminal. Yeah. And get right back out again. If you're not going to be held and if you're not facing, you know, severe time, there's really no reason not to do it in their mind. Especially if you can get right back out. Exactly. Yeah, we would, funding, we just put a proposal for a company – in Orange County, a jewelry store, and uh, the, what the bill rate and their budget was, and what they wanted, we just couldn't. We couldn't help them out because our guys are like retired veterans, you know, but retired cops to do the job for asset protection for, especially with a jewelry store going in the holiday season. And I'm like, man, this is becoming a liability for us to give them uh, security service, and it's not really worth it yet. We do the liability risk, and it's like it's not worth it, right? We got, we got to get, you know, make a certain amount as a company and pay workman comp insurance because who knows they could get robbed and one round goes off. You're filing paperwork and, go, as you know, going to court and that's millions of dollars in a hit. And I think a lot of security companies are almost willing to take a loss to get a job and it's so, so not worth it. Especially from a attorney standpoint, you, you get the risk, you get the, all that. <laughs> and people just aren't thinking, they're thinking about the bottom line and well, how, how can I save money? But if that round goes up and someone gets shot and they go to a hospital, that's just a court mess. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I think people are trying to save money, but in a they're gambling by saving that money and not paying for a quality product or security services. And it's like you get what you pay for. And you know, they go, you know, we'll call a certain, I'm not gonna name names on the podcast, but they're gonna name a one of the big two that are out there and they're going to get what they pay for. And then they're going to get into court, but they have billions of dollars back in them and they can, they have in-house attorneys. So they don't really care. Yeah. Yeah. What was it like? So did you, when you worked on these cases with these celebrities, do you, do you have much interaction or you work with their, you said their security team usually, and that's how that works on that end. Some of them you have no interaction with whatsoever. The two exceptions, I'm actually looking at my notes. Um, that I prepared the two exceptions were Gwyneth Paltrow and Jackson Brown. Okay. Um, and, and Gwyneth largely because her case went to trial. What was that about? What was that case? She was talking weirdo chasing her down or something. Yeah. It was right after she did the movie Shakespeare love and the perpetrator who I'm not going to name was a okay. memory serves me correctly. It was something like a 55 year old, Domino's Pizza Delivery Boy from Columbus, Ohio. Wow. Sees the movie, falls in love with her. <laughs> and the, you know, he starts writing and, and sending letters and then it turns into sex toys and it gets, gets really scary for her and it, it graduates. And for a long time, her security team was willing to just let him do this from afar, rightly so, because he was far away, which they wanted. And they would intercept the packages so she didn't have to see them. But eventually he hired a private investigator, which was a recurring theme in my cases. He hired a private investigator to find out where she lived. And at the time she lived in, she was still single during these days. Um, and she lived with her parents, Blythe Danner, her mother, famous actress, and her father and family in uh, Santa Monica. So he found out. 
where she lived. And Blythe was actually out in the yard gardening one day and he walks up and she knew right away who he was. And they had a short conversation. He left. Of course, she calls the security team and they call the police and they ended up finding him and, and we prosecuted him. But he was he was what we call an erotomatic, which was a delusional mm. person. Okay. Uh, which are some of the scariest because they're very difficult to deal with. And cause and effect doesn't work and you can't reason with them. You know, they hear what they want to hear. And, and so they're very difficult people to deal with. That, that case, like I said, went to trial. 